Good morning. My name is Josh Holstein. I'm the youth pastor here. Um, good to have you guys here. If I haven't met you yet, it's probably because it's my second week, um, but I would love to meet you guys um, and get to know you and make you feel welcome if you're newer. I get the privilege to do the call to worship today. Um, when we think of worship, it's really us joining in and worship that's already going on. It's really us getting to join in in the angels singing worship to God. Spurgeon once said, Jehovah is infinite and therefore cannot really be made greater, but his name grows in manifested glory as he is made known to his creatures, and thus he is said to be magnified. We stand with me as I read our call to worship and we prepare our hearts to magnify him. O oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord, and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant, and their faces shall never be ashamed. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Let's pray with me. Father, we thank you that we are here today getting to join in that worship, getting to manifest and believe and sing what it is you are. You're one who brings us out of trouble. You're one who brings us out of despair, and we thank you for that today. Praise your name. Amen. Remain standing as we sing. Your 
Lord Jesus, when he was on the earth, uh, took pity on the disciples who fell asleep when they were supposed to be praying for him. And he said, the spirit's willing, but the flesh is weak. Uh, the Apostle Paul puts it more like this. The things I want to do, I don't do. The things I want to stop doing, I keep right on doing. And I find it to be a law in my body that whenever I seek to do good, evil is right there with me. Let's go to the Lord and confess our weakness, our inability to be what he know, we know he's calling us to be and receive his grace. Please pray with me. Our Father in heaven, we confess that we are daily falling short of what we know we ought to be. We confess that we were too weak to hold our tongues and we shouldn't have spoken. And we were too weak to say the words of encouragement and grace that we ought to have said. Until we were too weak to control our bodies and withstand temptation. We were too weak to go and help those who needed our bodies to be present. We confess there is no health in us. Would you restore those who ask for your grace? Would you encourage those who feel tired coming and asking again? Would you remind us how gracious you are? We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's continue our repentance by singing this uh, great hymn, Dear Refuge of My Weary Soul. Please stand as we sing. Bye. 
Ten.
Good morning. Let me welcome you also to River Oaks Presbyterian Church. So glad that you are here. I'm Jonathan, one of the pastors here. And uh, here at River Oaks, uh, we are a church that believes that God is neither a Democrat nor a Republican and uh, that the gospel of Jesus Christ cannot be contained in a, any one human political system. And so uh, our church can and should be made up of people with differing views in the world and differing uh, political stripes. So wherever you are coming from this morning, if you're new, if you're a visitor to River Oaks, uh, you are welcome here. We are glad that you're here. Um, Today is the second of three, a series of three classes for new members after second service. And uh, if you are new or thinking about joining the church and miss this, that's okay. We will have another series of classes this fall. Um, but if, if you're coming to that, that's after second service. Lunch is included. Uh, you got to meet Josh earlier, our new youth pastor. And we are so excited that he's here. And he has hit the ground running. In fact, plan uh, two events already. So this Thursday, uh, anyone who's been or would like to be a youth leader, volunteer, uh, working with teenagers, students from 6th to 12th grade, um, there's going to be a meeting Thursday night, information here. And then next Sunday night, Josh has planned a welcome back Sunday uh, at 5.30 uh, in the Youth and Activities Building. That's for all students, leaders. Uh, it's going to be kind of regathering, and we're excited about that. Uh, there are more announcements on this sheet. I'll let you read them on your own. And uh, just let you know, we send out a Friday email called the Friday Update. Uh, if you are not currently getting that in your email, that means either I don't have your email or something. Let me know. I'll connect you, and you can get that. It is, uh, it is good. All right, let's, before we go any further, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Oh, Lord, our God, everyone wants to have a good life. And, Lord, there are a thousand theories in the world of how to live and how to have a good life. And, and no shortage of people selling us the key to having our best life now. But, Lord, we recognize that there is only one God who took on flesh to demonstrate how to live and, and who died in order to give us abundant life here and eternal life beyond this life. And so, Father, we come to you for the words of life. Uh, we come to your word and recognize here is truth. And, uh, Father, as we open the word this morning, we pray that you would... Fill us with your truth. Teach us your ways and how we ought to live and, uh, and how Jesus came to give us life more abundantly. And we pray this all in the name of Christ, our Savior. Amen. When I was in seminary, we had a professor who told us that we should, when we became pastors eventually, we should preach the parable of the prodigal son at least once a year. He said it is that uh, essential to understanding the Christian faith, that foundational for the Christian life, that we should keep coming back to it, right? Repetition is the key to learning. And so I'm following that advice this morning, coming back to maybe a familiar parable for many of us. Uh, the prodigal son parable. Um, but it's, it's also going to lead into next month, which uh, we're calling a covenant. Ricky's going to be preaching a series of sermons, uh, a series entitled Covenant Renewal, getting back to the basics of who we are as a church and kind of renewing our commitment to God and to each other. And uh, so I'm excited about this. So let's read this story. Uh, of the prodigal son. We find it in Luke chapter 15. If you would please stand for this reading of God's word. I'm going to start halfway through the story. So if you don't know the story, um, it's, it's a simple story. It's a story of a father with two sons. And the younger son comes to him one day and says, I want my share of the inheritance. 
and uh, the father gives him his share of the inheritance, and he goes off, and he lives it up, right? Parties every night until he spends all of his inheritance, and he's flat broke, finds himself living on the street, hungry, and, and realizes his only hope for survival is to go back to his father's house. Uh, but he recognizes that he's uh, just so disgraced his family that he can't go back as a son. He only hopes to go back as a servant. So we pick up the story in verse 20. And he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the, and the son said to him, Oh, did we lose it? I'll read from the old... The old uh, overhead. Oh, there we go. Son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his hand, shoes on his feet, and bring the fattened calf and kill it. And let, it, let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his older son was in the field. And as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, Your brother has come, and your father has killed the fattened calf, because he's received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him, but he answered his father, Look, these many years I have served you, and I never disobeyed your command. Yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. And when this son of yours came who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you're always with me, and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and to be glad for this. Your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. This is God's word for God's people for the good of the world. Peace be seated. When I was living in the Washington, D.C. area, uh, I was preparing a sermon series on the parables of Jesus. And, uh, and I decided to do something a little different. Um, I, because, I, you know, I, I grew up in the church. I grew up reading the Bible and sort of had, had adopted sort of a, a certain reading of the Scriptures and was familiar with the Bible, but I, I wanted to get a diff, some different perspective. And so I formed what I call a sermon support group or sermon discussion group. And it ended up being uh, three ladies who lived in our condominium building. Um, these ladies were all uh, older, single. I think they were all three divorced, and, and uh, none of them were churchgoers. And so I got them together for a series of, of meetings, and uh, the format was I would just simply read one of Jesus' parables, and then I would ask them what they thought, right, what their reaction was. And I wouldn't try to teach them or lead them, but I just wanted to get, wanted to hear it with fresh ears. And so the first night we got together, and I read this story, The Prodigal Son. And, uh, and I, I asked them what they thought, and here's what I thought. I thought that they would all identify with the younger brother, right? Younger brother who's, who's lost, who's messed up, and has to come back and needs the father's love and needs forgiveness. I'm not like, don't we all want, need grace? They all, none of them identified with the younger brother. They all identified with the older brother. And in fact, a couple of them were pretty upset with the father, for just letting the younger brother come back and not feel the consequences of his actions fully. I was shocked. But let me ask you that same question. Which of these two brothers, these two sons, do you identify with? The, the wild rebel, younger brother, or the dutiful but angry older brother? Now this story... It's often been called the story of the lost son, which, which makes sense because in the, in the context of Luke 15, Jesus is telling three stories about lost things. 
tells the story of a lost sheep and then a lost coin and now a lost son. But really, as we're going to see, this is really the story of two lost sons. Now, there's a lot going on this story from a cultural perspective. A lot more than you get when you first read this story, you know, with modern 21st century American Western ears. Um, and the first thing that we need to start with is we need to understand the impact of the son, his request to his father. He asks him, he literally says, give me the share of property that is coming to me. This is back in verse 12. Now, so this is, he wants his share of the property, his inheritance. Now, when my wife and I were buying our first house, my in-laws gave us some money to help us with the down payment, right? They called, this is an advance on your inheritance. And they gave Rachel's brother the same amount of money. But inheritances in Jesus' day and in that culture worked very differently, right? Because money and a family's wealth was not primarily, right, in, in coins or paper and in a bank or tied up in mutual funds, right? A family's wealth was primarily in, what? Their land and in the animals that they owned and, and their ability to work the land and farm and, and make a living that way, right? In fact, land was extremely valuable. In some ways, you had two kinds of people in that world, right? Those who owned land, landowners, and those who didn't, right? And if you had it, you held on to it for generations, it's extremely, extremely valuable. And, and the father, uh, was, who was the head of the household, was responsible for the family land and for the extended family, which would have lived all together on that family estate. And so to ask your father for your inheritance, to, to have your part of the land, and then to go and sell it off was would have been asking him to do damage to the family, right? To do, to do damage to the family's ability to make money, to, to be able to provide. It would, and it would also essentially be saying, Dad, I wish you were dead. Because I want my inheritance now, right? Didn't do that. Now, the older son in Jewish families was expected when the father did eventually die to become the head of the larger extended family, right? And so from the beginning of the story, we need to realize that the, the younger brother's demand for his share of the inheritance was not only a massive insult to the father, but was also greatly impacted the older brother, right? Since, since if he sold off the family land, he would essentially be weakening the family standing in the community and weakening their ability to make money and to provide. And so when you get that, you, you realize that the older brother has a legitimate beef, right? The younger brother's leaving didn't just mean that the house was quieter, right? It meant the family had lost this standing. And then when the father welcomes the, the younger brother back, and he puts the ro ring on his finger and the robe on him. He is essentially saying, bringing him back into full sonship. You're my son again, giving him a share in the inheritance again. And so the older brother's losing another part of his inheritance by the younger brother coming back. So what is the, the, bro the older brother, you can look at me, he has a legitimate thing, right? He wants justice. He wants Stability for his family and his fair inheritance. And so you can hear all the emotions in his voice when he comes and finds out that his younger brother has come back and his father has allowed him to come back. He gets a feast for being a total mess up? Where's, where's my feast? I'm the one who deserves it. I'm the one who stayed. I'm the one who has done his duty. The one this family can count on. Now, the older brother wouldn't have been the only one who was angry with the younger brother, right? Kenneth Bailey was a Bible scholar who in the 1960s went and lived in 
the Middle East, you know, part of the world where Jesus had lived. And among people who, in many ways, had, were living basically in a similar situation to from the first century. Customs, traditions, you know, lack of technology, none of that had really changed over the years. And so he was living with them and, and began to talk to them about the culture of the Bible. And then he brought up this story. And he asked the people, he said, what would have happened if a son had asked his father for his inheritance? What would happen here? And the villagers said, that would never happen. It would never happen, right? The disgrace brought on the family would have been so great, no son would ever think of doing what this young son, this younger brother did. But, but Bailey insisted. He said, well, but what if it did happen, right? And, and, then, and then the son came home. What would happen? Listen to what they said. They said, well, the men of the town would have met this son at the, at the gates of the village would have beaten him severely. Uh, and then the father would have left the son to beg outside his house for weeks, maybe even months. And then, if the father were a generous man, he would allow his son finally to become his servant. Which is what the younger brother expects, doesn't he? Right? No longer worthy to be called your son. I could just be a servant could at least live. He, deserved, he knew he deserved to be disowned, fully expected to live in dishonor and shame for the rest of his life. Do you see then how radical and jarring Jesus' image of a father running out to meet his son is? He's happy to see his son, but he's not just happy. He's also <laughs> probably going to try to get to his son before everybody else does, right? To protect him. And then he does the unthinkable act of restoring his son completely. It's a, it's a beautiful picture of grace, which would probably would have been pretty incomprehensible to Jesus' original audience, his hearers. It's a beautiful picture of grace to us, I think, but it was anything but beautiful to the older brother. In fact, it was deeply offensive to him. Tonight, uh, the Academy Awards is going to be happening. It's going to be on TV, and my family kind of gets in every year, gets into the, the Oscars and filling out ballots, who we think, which movies we think are going to win, and inevitably I'm disappointed uh, with what movie wins best picture, because I'm a film snob. But uh, in 1984, the movie that won best picture was a very worthy winner. It was a movie called Amadeus, and it's a story of two compo classical composers, Mozart and uh, Antonio Salieri, who were real composers, of course, lived about the same time. The story of the, the movie is completely made up, but it's a great story, okay? So it, it starts with uh, Salieri, who is older than Mozart, who is... Who is uh, uh, attained a, a career in music. He's the court composer in Austria. He, Austria, he's very well respected, has a very good life, and is happy with how things are going until Mozart shows up. And he very, Salieri very quickly realizes that Mozart's musical genius is beyond anything that he will ever attain to. But instead of welcoming Mozart, in, and even trying to learn from him, he is filled with anger and jealousy. And he's not only angry at Mozart, he's angry at God. And in a very memorable scene, Salieri takes the, the crucifix that he wore off his neck, and he throws it into a fire, and he tells God that you and I are enemies from now on. See, older brothers cannot see beyond their hurt, beyond their need to be right in order to see other people's pain, in order to see other people's success, in order to see other people's need for grace. But listen, listen to how tender the Father's words are. 
to his older son. In verses 31 and 32, Son, you're always with me. All that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad. For this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. See, the, the real problem in this story is not the loss of the inheritance. The real problem is the loss of the relationship. See, when you get down to it, neither of these brothers, neither of these sons is really acting like a son. Both are finding their identity and significance apart from their father, right? The younger brother, by going off and doing whatever he wants, defining his life, finding his significance, in feeding his every desire and doing it my way, right? But the older brother, he is finding his joy and his significance in doing his duty, doing what is right, right? According to the rules but also apart from his relationship with his father. Neither finds their joy or significance or identity in the father's love and relationship. See, at the, at the heart of Christianity, it, it, the Christian faith is not about doing our duty primarily. It is about the first and greatest commandment, which is what? Love. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second commandment is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. The center of Christianity is a relationship of love, and neither of these sons is showing or experiencing love for their father, though he is showing great love to them. They're making life about themselves. Now, the younger brother is a lot like Israel, Israel in the Old Testament. Right? Israel was called to be God's special chosen people, to worship and serve him alone. But, but they're constantly going astray, right? You can't go two pages in the Old Testament without the people running after the gods of their neighbors and becoming like them and falling into great sin, right? And I imagine a lot of us have had periods in our lives when we have been the younger brother, when we've gone running after whatever we wanted to do. Right? We've run away from God and responsibility, lived only for ourselves and our good pleasure. But this morning I want to focus on the older brother. The Old Testament also has a lot of examples of older brothers. Right? From the very beginning, Cain, Adam and Eve's son, was an older brother, literally and spiritually. So angry that his worship was not accepted, but his brother's was that he kills his brother Abel. Job's friends, older brothers, right? Looking at the fact that they still have their families, they still have their wealth, and thinking themselves better than Job, who's lost it all. Jonah was a classic older brother, right? Only, only concerned about himself and his people, not wanting the people of Nineveh to get grace, wanting to see them destroyed. I wonder, do you identify with any of these older brothers? Or let's try this. You might be an older brother if. You might be an older brother if you believe that God owes you a good life because of all the good things you've done for him. You might be an older brother if you believe that the success you've had in life is mainly attributable to your hard work. You might be an older brother if you think that poor people are all lazy and don't deserve help. Or you think that having better theology makes you a better person than those people with bad theology. You might be an older brother if you can't think of anything to pray about during the confession of sin each week. You might be an older brother if you can't forgive people who have offended you. Or you just have to be right when you argue with your spouse. Or your kids only get your approval if they get the good grades and make the sports team. 
Finally, you might be an older brother if you forget that you were once a younger brother in need of grace. I'll give you a perfect example of an older brother. It's me when it comes to my lawn. Okay, when, when I have been working on my yard, gotten rid of all the weeds and it's looking good, drive around the neighborhood and I notice, right, the yards that still have all the weeds and need to be mowed. I'm like, come on, people. Don't you care about your neighborhood? Don't you care about your neighbors? But if my yard is like it is right now, full of weeds, hasn't been mowed, I don't know, forever, right, needs all this tension, then I'm kind of driving around looking at the people with the really nice yards and going, why do you idolize your yard so much? Come on. I mean, it's clear you're not spending enough time with your family. You're doing else, right? Either way, I'm right. Right? And that's the thing with older brothers. Always have to be right. And in extreme cases, lack the ability to, to even question if they're wrong, right? We all know of people who have bounced from job to job or from church to church, right? And pretty soon they've been six, eight places in ten years. And it's always the boss's fault. And a terrible boss there. Oh, horrible culture there. That pastor was the worst never stopping to connect the dots and, and, right and not all church jobs are great but never stopping to connect the dots what is the common theme maybe it's me older brothers can't see that but here's the question you may have wondered about if you've read this story before what happens next in this story because it ends pretty abruptly right like the father's out there pleading with the brother and and then just ends. Jesus ends the story. What happens next? So, did, does the older brother go into the party? Do they, do they make up? Does he forgive his brother? What happens? Well, the answer is the older brother kills the father. Wait, what? Where is that? Where do you read that? Go back to the context of Luke 15. Jesus is who is he talking to? He's talking to the Pharisees. The Pharisees are classic older brothers, right? Who are, they're the, in fact, the ultimate older brothers, taking pride in their ability to keep the law, looking down on anyone who fails to keep the law in its ultimate sense. And these same Pharisees, right, they're criticizing Jesus for hanging out with people with bad reputations and low morals and they are the ones who would work hard to get Jesus arrested, accused and ultimately put to death that's what happens with those older brothers and Jesus is trying to tell them and he's trying to tell us through the power of story that they are in danger of loving their own righteousness so much that they will write God out of their lives. They will write out their need for grace, their need for God. He's trying to warn them of the reality that they would have never imagined for all the world that they are in grave danger of living without eternally apart from God. Sinclair Ferguson says this. He says, religious people like the Pharisees are always profoundly disturbed when they discover that they are not and never have been true Christians. Does all this religion count for nothing? Those hours in church, hours spent doing good things, hours involved in religious activity, do they not count for something in the presence of God? Do they not enable me to say, look at what I've done. Don't I deserve heaven? Sadly, Ferguson says, thinking that I deserve heaven is a sure sign I have no understanding of the gospel. There's the thing. I think for us, it's not really a question of, am I self-righteous? It's more a question of, how self-righteous am I? I think the Christian life is in some ways about uncovering 
more and more of my own self-righteousness. And there's a paradox that the more mature you become as a Christian, the more able to see your self-righteousness you become. You begin to be able to see the sins that are below the surface sins. And the most self-righteous people are the ones who don't think that they are self-righteous at all. So the million-dollar question is, then becomes, well, how do we keep from being older brothers then? Three things, very quickly. Number one, realize that all of life is grace. Right? Every good thing you have is a gift from God, from your family to your strengths, your abilities, your health, your, to the, all the good things that happen in your life. The Bible says they are all good gifts from God. You earn them, you didn't deserve them. They're God's kindness to you, so give thanks for them. Older brothers don't know how to give thanks. Those who understand grace do. Number two, realize that you are not better than anyone else, right? There is a, there is a fundamental equality for all people in both our basic problem and our cure, right? What is our basic problem? We are sinners in need of Jesus. My sin may look different from yours. It may look different, right, from the junkie living in the street or the Wall Street swindler in white-collar prison. But our basic problem is still the same. We still need Jesus, and the cure is the same. The gospel of Jesus, we all need it. And then thirdly, keep from becoming an older brother. Allow God to love you like a father and learn to love like him. Let your life be defined by giving grace to others. And look again at, at how the father responds to both of his sons, but to the older brother, right? When the older brother throws a pity party and refuses to go in, what does the father do? He doesn't he doesn't yell at his son. He doesn't belittle him for being so immature. He, he reaches out to him. He reminds them of their relationship and of his love for him and of what's important. In many ways, this is Jesus pleading with his worst enemies, right? See, Jesus loves not only wild rebels. He loves hardened religious Pharisees. He loves them so much that he wants to... Free them from the shackles of their performance acceptance prison. He loves them so much that he wants them to be free, to uh, feel loved, and to experience and understand grace. He loved them so much that he died for them. Imagine a church full of people who are constantly thankful for the grace of God in their lives. Imagine a group of older brothers who were overwhelmed and undone by the love of the Father going into the party and forgiving the younger brother and hugging him and sitting down for a feast. I think that would make for a joyful church. It would make not only us happy, I think it would make God happy. I love what Charles Spurgeon says. He says, believer, you are happy when God blesses you, but not as happy as God is. You're glad when you're pardoned, but he who pardons you is more glad. The prodigal son come back to his home, was very happy to see his father, but not as delighted as his father was to see him. The father's heart was more full of joy because his heart was larger than his son's. Friends, the world and the church, full of older brothers. Read the comment sections on any political article or blog or Facebook post, right? It's chock full of people telling you exactly how right they are, exactly how wrong you are. Not pausing to think, where am I wrong? The world's full of older brothers. Let's show them grace. But one more thing. Let's not keep, let them keep us from going to the party. Right? Because we're going to have a party with or without them. Jesus says the kingdom of heaven is a feast. But it's only entered into by grace. 
So will you come? Let's pray. Father, we are grateful that you do not leave us to our own senses, to our own ideas of our own righteousness and our flawed ways of trying to earn our spiritual resume to earn our way to heaven because our sin creates a canyon of divide between us and you. We cannot work our way and cannot atone for our own sins. So we thank you that Jesus has done that for us. And Father, and as we now live in light of that, would you teach us what it means to love you, to find our identity in you, to find our joy in obeying you, but in such a way that we remember that we are still always in need of grace and that we need to give grace to those around us, speak the truth in love, and to be motivated by the good news of the gospel. Father, would you do that in us, we pray. Jesus' name, amen. Well, sometimes uh, people wonder what their giving goes to, and uh, if, if uh, you had not been giving, we might not have been able to hire our new youth pastor. And, but you have been, and we're grateful to do that. And as our youth ministry grows and as our children's ministry grows, we're going to continue to need to provide staffing and buildings and resources for those things. And so uh, that is what your giving goes to. And we appreciate it and uh, we're grateful for it. So we're going to sing our uh, hymn of response. Jesus cast a look on me is one of my favorite hymns. Please stand as we, as we talk about Jesus making us poor and keeping us low. text it ends with a party so this is a good one and uh, it's a party that we're all invited to as I think about the parties I missed and I missed a ton as a young uh, man uh, sometimes I missed them because I felt like I was too good to go but usually I missed them because I didn't honestly believe anybody there wanted me to be there and 
as God continually, perpetually invites us to his party, where not, not where he has prepared a feast, but where he has laid down himself as the feast, he wants us to know. And he's, he's, he's essentially hired me and Jonathan and all ministers to go out and to beat the bushes and to let you know he wants you at his feast. Will you come? Please pray with me. Our Father in heaven, thank you for preparing this feast for us. And we pray that you would heal our fear and our shame and anything that would prevent us from coming and feasting on your Son. Now that which I received, I pass on to you. The Lord Jesus Christ, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup. And he said, This cup is the new covenant, which is sealed by the shedding of my blood for the forgiveness of your sins. Drink it, all of you. And therefore, as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we do show forth the Lord's death until he comes. On that night, Jesus gave this meal to his disciples, and I today, as a minister in his name, do give it to you. We have stations set up on all four tables, and we'll have elders there. We ask that you would send one person from your row or family to kind of take all the elements uh, for your group and bring them back, and we'll take them together. Please uh, come to the table. Take and eat the body of Christ. And the blood of Christ shed for you. Drink all of you. Now go in peace. Please stand as we sing our final hymn.
According to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 Go in peace. <laughs>